Thank you very much. So um, I really love these XKCD comics. Yeah, the, uh, the, someone's showing someone else the code, and they're saying it's a little messy, they're a little bit anxious. The person says, it's no problem, it's no problem, I can code. And they sit down, and the response is, oh, I don't understand this. This looks a little bit messy. All of us have had this experience where we wrote something that we were proud of. We created it, and we knew there was something a little bit off, but when we showed it to someone else, their response wasn't the same as we liked. Who here has had this experience before? It's happened to all of us, right? Part of this is because when we create something, the thing we see isn't all that's there. Half of it is living inside our own heads. And of, of course, the person we're showing it to can't see what's inside our heads. Sometimes the person you're showing it to is yourself a week later. And you've forgotten everything that was in your head. I love this quote about programming. The programmer works slightly removed from pure thought stuff, like a poet. He builds his castles in the air, from air, creating by exertion of the imagination. Few media of creation are so flexible, so easy to polish and to rework, so readily capable of realizing grand conceptual structures. That means that we can create so many beautiful things, but they all start here. But what often happens is something called spaghetti code. Spaghetti code is a loose term. It's come to mean many things. Basically, code that is difficult to understand because it seems overly complex or obtuse. Simplest examples are a script. In this case, uh, uh, a script that at first seems simple. I mean, all scripts run from top to bottom. There's no, there's no complexity that a script could have. But because we can have go-tos or loops or whatever, it's possible to read a script and not have and in, in your eye and not go from top to bottom like we're reading a paper. It may go up and down and up and down. And you have this experience where you realize the variable's created here and it's used down here, but it uses this other variable and it goes up and down and up and down until your eyes are getting a little tired, you know, just from looking at it. If you rearrange it into something linear, you can have the exact same logic, but the whole thing can feel clear, like a progressive progressive idea going from setting up a world to outputting some result. Calling functions can have spaghetti kind of scenarios. Here's two different kinds of models. This one right here, and this linear one here where you have a function that calls a function that calls a function. Raise your hand if you think the one on this side looks more spaghetti-ish than the other one. What about the other side? The left, this, this side looks a lot more simple. One calls another, calls another, but this one often ends up being the most maintainable of the two. That's because whenever you're reading code, you want to understand what's happening underneath. And these have fewer chains to find out what's happening underneath. It also means that if you change some function, it affects fewer parts of your code, where here, the code at the bottom is so stable because you know, as the writer, if you change one thing about this, it has a potential to affect everything in your code. This ends up being the more stable structure. What about this? Here we have um, some objects that call each other. Here's only four, so it's pretty short. Here's another one, it's much longer chain, but we have arrows that point up and down. We have things that call each other. And we have this other thing over here. Raise your hand if you think this one is the easiest to understand of the, of the three. All right. What about this one here? What about this one here? So you raise your hand. Now you, you've seen. If it's wide, then it's easier to understand. But did you know that this one here and this one here are exactly the same? It's just rearranged so that all of them point downwards. There's a trick in object-oriented programming called a dependency inversion through abstract methods that allows you to reverse the direction of lines so that way your stack of code, while it can call top to bottom, can actually be maintainable. That's not really what we're going to be talking about because what ends up happening is not something that's a nice, stable structure. 
eventually, whenever someone doesn't understand it, they find something they do understand, and they add something, and they add something, until it becomes what's known as the big ball of mud. And once you have the big ball of mud, you never lose the big ball of mud because someone needs to add and add and add until finally they throw it away because it's no longer useful. We have to find ways to get around the big ball of mud. In order to understand, in, in doing that, we need to understand what we're writing. This mostly comes from that first feeling of pressure, that wanting to continue to create. When you write code just so it works, you end up creating structures that become harder to understand. That means harder to communicate to someone else and harder to allow them to extend. Um, Robert Martin, who, who gives these great talks on clean coding and clean architecture and, and just good software practices, talks a lot about how most of our time is spent reading code rather than writing it. Um, readability counts is a big motto of the Python ecosystem. And a lot of the Python language, the decisions about the Python language were about what would make something more readable. As a community, then we have a good head start when it comes to creating readable code because we've already decided that we prize that. Let's see what we can do in a very small example in order to produce something that is more readable. In this case, we're gonna have this hypothetical example where I've written this code and I'm giving it to you. I'm the person saying, hey, I, look at this thing I made. What do you think? It's simple, it's simple code and uh, it doesn't use any complex Python structures. It just assigns variables. It just uses a few operators down here. You've looked at it now for almost a minute. Raise your hand if you understand what this code does. Good. A lot of people understand what it does. Raise your hand if you understand why I wrote it. You have no idea. Of course not. So where's the value in this code? There's none. It does do exactly what I want it to do, but because we don't know why, what it's good for, what it can be applied to, and other problems, this code ends up having very little value and will eventually be done. Now you may say, Nick, well, if you just written some comments, Geez, I, don't need, I barely even have a, a, a file name. Then I could understand the rest. So I'll add comments. That's usually the first thing people do when they want to explain code to someone else. They don't want to break the code, so they'll add things that Python won't see in order to explain to whoever might be reading it what's happening. Now, who has a better idea of why this code was written? A little bit better, right? Now we have some, some, some things that uh, relate to the world. Red, green, blue, readiness, readiness. We know we're trying to get at the end the mean brightness of some pixel, so that's pretty useful. But if, some, if you were to be asked to extend it or, or to, to, to apply it to something else, that readiness thing, that thing, that variable that if you look at closely never gets used anywhere else, ends up interfering with your ability to understand it or even be comfortable applying it to other situations. Is this a bug? The whole thing seems to work, but someone wrote this code. Was there a purpose for it? At this point, if, you, if I were trying to give you this code, you'd probably say, well, maybe you should clean it up before you give it to me, all right? We're gonna go through now the, the, some processes uh, of, of safely refactoring code, so that way it slowly gets more information in it, it slowly becomes more flexible and more modular, and as a result, gains more value. Everyone with me? Before we start, though, we're gonna change code. Change code means breaking code. As soon as you touch the keyboard, the very first time, the whole thing's gonna fall apart, so we need some, some tools that will allow us to make these changes safely. We never wanna be in a situation as, as creationists, uh, creationists, as create, creating people, as creative people, where we don't want to con continue making things just because we're afraid of what we, we might lose. So we're gonna bring two tools with us. The first one being a, a version control system, like Git. At the very least, we want to be able to save our code and say, this is where it was while it worked, so that I can always do, press the big undo button and go back. The good, uh, now you may say, well, I can just make a copy of my code. That way I've got my good code and I've got my new code. But you're gonna, be, you're gonna want to make new changes all the time. You don't want to have copies lying around. This way you can always move forward and you can always go back as many steps as you like. 
A second is a test runner. You, if you know one thing that the code should do, and you say, well, look, if it does this, then I'm still happy, then you can write one test that's, that just runs and checks to see if it still does that thing. That will give you some confidence that at least the code runs to the end. If you can write more tests, then all the better. Let's assume we've done that. We've saved the code, we're willing to make some change, and we want to make sure that this result never changes. I'm just gonna assume that it's gonna do that this whole time. Let's look at this, at this bar right here. How do we refactor code to variables that are created but never used? It's very simple. We call it dead code. Code that's never used by your program has no value because it doesn't actually contribute to the final behavior of the program. It's a zombie. It's code that starts out looking like it might have value, but it slowly eats away as it starts to, 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 to uh, distract you from the actual purpose of your code. How do you refactor dead code? You kill it. Look at that. Isn't it already cleaner? It's beautiful. Well, what about this part right here? Now you may say, look, this, Nick, these comments are not code. In fact, they're helping me understand it, but in the extreme program, the, this whole movement called extreme programming, they, they stipulated that comments are actually contributing to code. They're, and they're another type of dead code because when you change code that's, um, that's run, you rarely change the code that's not run. If I were to change this from being representing red to blue, I would probably not touch the comment. I'd forget it because it's just, it just not my highest priority. Comments at best are a little helpful, at worst are actually wrong and make it harder for you to understand the code. We should get rid of these comments and make it a goal to not have comments. Comments are a symptom that our code is not easy to understand. That's why we wrote it. But now, we're, since we're fixing our code, we're making it more easy to understand the comments have to go. The symptom has to go. So, we get rid of it. We make clear variable names. When you have a line comment, it's telling you that the variable should be called that thing. Look at that, isn't that easier to understand? Next problem, Every, in order to understand the flow of this program, I have to jump my eyes back and forth. I have red up here and it's used down here. Then I see there's green, oh, it's used up here, back and forth and back and forth. One way that you can simplify the flow of your programs is to, is to make sure that wh wherever a variable is being used, where it was created is close, close by. Let's move the distance between them as close as possible. This is where spaghetti, spaghetti code starts coming in. So now we cluster this. Isn't this easier? It's, the whole thing goes top to bottom. Red, green, and blue are created right where they're actually used. And we have a, an idea of these steps that the whole thing is going through. But look, we still have some dead code, some comments floating around. When you have blocks, when you have a, a comment that's describing a block of code, you can get rid of that comment. What you're saying is that this chunk of code does one thing. Well, we've got a name for that in Python. It's called a function. So let's kill it. The very simplest kind of function that you can make is, some, is, is essentially a macro. It takes no inputs, it just returns an output. You just put a big wall around that code and say this thing outputs this one thing. We block it off and now we output this one thing. Now this may seem a little bit more complex already. Sometimes it gets more complex for a, a little bit while you're refactoring. But the good thing about it is that there are only three variables now that this, this program depends on. No longer 12 variables like before. But we can continue refactoring it because now we've got a spaghetti code problem. Now we have to jump, jump down. Let's, let's just kind of cluster it together. Now our whole script is just these three lines. Of course it's using functions up here, but each of those can be understand on their own. But there's something that's not labeled here. Hard-coded values. There are three types of hard-coded values in code. They all represent, you do different things with them because they represent different concepts. These numbers, three, three, and two, represent domain knowledge in the person writing it. If we read this more carefully, we'll see that before we use the three, we're summing three numbers. And down here, three numbers, and down here, two numbers. The numbers three, three, two represent the concept of an average. 
we can make our code more understandable if we replace these values with the concept that they're supposed to represent. And we have a function built into Python for that. This contributes to ravioli code. There's all kinds of pasta code out there. Ravioli code is code that is understandable when you look at pieces, but you can't, but don't come together in a clear whole, all right? These numbers are getting in the way of under, us understanding the whole process, the whole concept underlying the code. So let's take the mean function from the statistics library. And now we've gotten rid of our hard-coded values. We're starting to see that these two functions are very similar to each other. We probably knew that already because it has, it, it, one has a two next to it. But we need to get rid of more hard-coded values before they become exactly similar. These, uh, th this starts to, re to represent one of the other two kinds of hard-coded values, either an expected use case or data. Expected use cases mean that the, it's a value that is often used. You, the, the person creating it will say, look, I know that if you use this function, you're probably gonna have this value, all right? That happens all the time. So plotting libraries have tons of inputs and most of them are set as default values. But this, this isn't like that. This is data. These are actual pixel values. Pixel values don't belong here. Pixel value, values belong in the function, that, in the code that calls the function. Someone gives you these values. The, the, the function doesn't suggest these values to the user, so we move them down here. And now our code is a lot simpler and we have two functions that are exactly the same. That's when you know that you're safe to kill the, the duplicated function. Your code is suddenly non-dry. Dry stands for do, don't repeat yourself. It's an acronym that people say often. Now you have to be careful around dry because sometimes when you delete something, you delete something that looks similar on the surface but in actuality is being repeated for a different reason. If it's for a different reason, you don't want to delete it because it's different. In this case, they're exactly the same. We can kill that. And now our code is a lot simpler. Isn't that nice? So good. Yeah. And you're clapping now because you think I'm done. But, look, we can go keep on going forever. I'm gonna go a little bit further, but this whole thing can, can be broken down into just these lines, okay? If we do that though, if the whole thing becomes re uh, reduced and people get obsessed with reducing code and deleting lines, we start to lose the thing that, that, that causes us to refactor in the per first place, the understandability. I love this phrase and it's used a lot in the refactoring community or in even like style guide discussions. Let's see what we can do to continue to refactor it, continue to reduce replication while at the same time increasing the, 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 the the, the communication in the code. A lot of that comes here. Look, we're calling the same function twice. That means we're really just trying to do one thing with two pieces of data. Let's just do one thing with two pieces of data by pulling the data out of the functions. We've got more variables now, but look, I'm first I'm saying this is a set of data that has to be created at the same time. T uh, tuple unpacking is a really nice way to be able to do that make a single state change in a single line of code. And now because this code is together, it should probably be packaged. This is now two pixels, two, two containers of data. We're actually telling Python now that these variables belong together. And since they belong together, and they have the same, the same variable names as our function, we can just pass the di dictionaries directly to our function. But this already is repeated. Now we're setting a dictionary twice. And what, we're, and what Python doesn't know is that these two things are related to each other. They should probably be a list of dictionaries. Now it's a list of pixels. There's so much more information already here. We can create all of our brightnesses at the same time. We can just do the mean of those. But now we're, we have an intermediate variable that doesn't actually represent the final goal of our code. Instead of having three steps, why don't we just have two steps? Define our data, calculate the thing we care about. Wouldn't that be easier to understand? We can do that. 
Now it's also faster because we didn't create a list of intermediate results in the, in the middle. At this point, is this little thing that always bothers me when I start looking at code that's gotten to this point. There's this tiny thing that you start to notice. You, ever, you, you notice how these, the red, the green, these two rows are exactly in line with each other? There is no reason for that. Style, the the uh, Python style guide says, actually, you shouldn't even do this. If you run a linter on this, it'll delete those. But there's a reason why we write it in the first place, because we know that these two dictionaries represent the same concept. There is so much information encoded in that extra space right there. We can communicate that too. And that's where we start to use some of, some of Python's more advanced features. We want, can bring that domain knowledge out. We could make a collection that's a special type representing that concept. For example, a named tuple. Named tuple is an object. Works similar to, it's like a hybrid between a dictionary and a tuple. We can create this and now it is a pixel. Our collection of pixels is made up of pixel objects. It's so much richer than what we had before. It's a little more complex to use them. But now all that information's there. But what we're missing now is the relationship between our pixel and git brightness. We could tell our, our git brightness function that it's expected to be used on pixels. Well, the typing module now has a, a new type way of, way of defining named tuples. They look like this, a lot like, uh, like models if, you, if you've used uh, various web frameworks. And you could add a property to this. You can say that the pixel's brightness can be created by using the git brightness function. And once you've done that, all you have to do is say, give me the brightness for each pixel. And this function here, if you were just to read it alone, you might not know, you might not know because Python is dynamically typed that it's expected to be used on numbers and what's supposed to come out. Well, you can use type hints. And suddenly, you have three integers that are going to functions, expect to return a float. You have a doc string that explains what's going on. At this point, I see some of you frowning. You're saying, whoa. It was fine up until right then. This is way, way too complex. This is ridiculous. Are we now in a ravioli code situation? We have a lot of information here, but how they connect is being hard to understand? Well, maybe. Think about this example in a bigger sense. If you have many files, many modules, and a team of people working on different parts of it, they're not gonna see all the things that you just saw at once. That ability to see everything at once is huge. We put tons of information together. Imagine if someone is just looking at the application and all they see is this. Now, without seeing the rest of it, they can understand the purpose of this code on its own. The person who's writing the models they can describe the interfaces to that model on their own and be confident that others using them will be able to use them for good purposes. And the person writing the algorithms will be able to, to define them on their own and explain their purposes without relying on the other parts of code. If your code gets to be so big that you can't hold all of it in your mind at once or expect any one person to even try to hold all of it in your mind, you might want to consider using some of these more more extensive features of Python. But in the case of one, uh, one, uh, one screen, this is quite good enough. You can see all that information. The extra space does tell us that extra thing. Look at how far we've come. These two pieces of code do the same thing. They, and from Python's standpoint, from the computer standpoint, they're exactly the same code. But this code, even though it's not essentially different, it's linearized on the computer, is so much more easy to, to, to manage, to understand, and easier to extend. The big picture I want you to get from this is that, um, that code is meant for humans. That when code doesn't explain the writer's thoughts, it's difficult to understand. That makes it difficult to extend. It's why pair programming is so important. If you just work alone and you're just writing, you'll be alone with your thoughts, living in an echo chamber. Then it's, it's no wonder it's a surprise when we show our code to someone else always strive to at least use Python as your collaborator, explaining your intention, explaining the knowledge that you have and why you're creating what you're creating. And there's some techniques and terms that I hope you've, you've learned. 
what dead code is, that dead code should be killed. Anything that doesn't contribute should be gone. Spaghetti code is code that, that's hard to, uh, hard to understand because you have to jump, make leaps in logic and track things in your memory all the time. Ravioli code is simple to understand in pieces, but hard to understand as a whole. And that code that, that has repetition in it doesn't need it, that you, that you can manage it a lot simpler by removing the repetition. But be careful. Thank you for your attention. I recommend Martin Fowler's refactoring book, which has a lot of this in greater detail than I could have done today. so much, Nick. Um, that was interesting, and I was thinking about my own code and thinking about what I have to change in there. <laughs> um, Kelvin is next. Is Kelvin in, in the house already? Fantastic. We'll have uh, time for just one or two quick questions before Kelvin comes on. So um, ask your questions to Nick, and he'll also be around, and we'll be happy to talk to you uh, as well. So please, any questions for Nick on the topic of refactoring? Um, hello, my name is Islam. Um, my question here is, when we went or you started your presentation and there was the code that was hard to trace or read and, or not organized and then we moved on to stage, different stages until it got organized at the end. Um, my question here is, how can one practice to reach from the first stage to the last stage? Easily, so how can one manage to directly uh, write his code to end up with this end result that we seen in your presentation? Thank you. Thank you for your question. There are two things that come out when uh, when someone's refactoring code. One of them is something that's gained purely by experience. It's an, it's it's, a, it's a, something called code smell. When you read enough code, you, you can start to detect aspects of it. Over time, you start to understand the relationship between that sense and the things that are actually implemented. The way I try to approach um, code that, 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 that is easy to understand is by, by separating the, con uh, the, co the concept of complexity into two parts. Essential complexity, which describes the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve, and artificial complexity, the, complex the complexity that arises merely as a result of trying to solve that problem. It's, uh, it's something that's, that's talked about a lot in coding circles. As humans, we're always creating things that are more complex than we wanted to. And, it, we, and as, as, as professionals, as builders, we must always strive to, to then take away the scaffolding that we use to get there. One of the simplest things you can do is pair programming. Explain to someone else what each line does. If you don't have a partner, find a rubber duck. Rubber duck programming is talking to someone else Explaining your code when they're not even a living person. If you just have your coffee cup, explain to your coffee cup what those lines of co uh, code do. If you can't explain one sentence and match it line by line in your code, there's probably some hidden artificial complexity. And you'll start saying, well, actually, these three lines of code do this one thing. That's a sign that this, is, this should be a function. Well, actually, OK, if we go over to this other module, then you'll see that there's some steps here. And actually, if we go over here, maybe you got some spaghetti code going on. You'll notice, just like when you're doing, uh, doing rehearsals for a talk, where that, where that uh, roughness is. And that speaking gives you the feedback you need to, in, in order to find the strategies that will get you there. Um, um, I wanted to know, because um, earlier you set up with um, to pull and packing, you, uh, and then um, you went on for that to um, create some dictionary, and then um, pass the whole dictionary to the function. And um, this here, the, 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 two, the two stars here? Yes, yes, on the other end, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you then moved on to name tuples. Yes. Yes. I want to know um, the reason for that, and I want to know since you created a name tuple, and um, I feel like you have to do something like that when you have to be creating pixels a lot. And um, as opposed to this method, where you can just um, get brightness um, function passing the whole um, you know stuff or so, and if you're not using something like that, like oh, if you're not, uh, if you don't really have to work with pixels all the time. What's um, the need of like creating that um, you know the whole name to object or so? 
know, yeah. I just want to know times when you can use the, uh, you know, creating them to go and then times you can go this way. Thank you for your question. Dictionaries and tuples have some, some trade-offs and advantages. Dictionaries are mutable, which means that if you change one value, it, you, you can keep the same identity without changing the others. That essentially says that you don't care so much about the identity of the whole of the collection. In the case of a pixel, if we change one brightness value of the blue, it changes our perception of, it, of that pixel's color. So by choosing an immutable, uh, an immutable sequence, we're also saying that that collection matters to us. If you want to change one thing, you have to make a copy of the whole, the whole data structure. The other nice thing about a name tuple is that it predefines the total amount of information and its location. In a dictionary, we can always add keys and remove keys. By, by, by choosing a data structure that is set upon creation, we will get errors whenever we try to add or change, change things. I wish there was, at least I don't, I'm not aware of right now, but I hope someone will tell me after the talk, of, a, of a, an immutable structure in Python that has a dictionary-like interface um, and can pre, be predefined pre um, at the beginning without going through a full um, object-oriented uh, approach. Um, but that, that's why I chose that. I would, uh, I'd, I'd love for there to be a special like star-star interface for objects, but this, uh, this was kind of my solution to that problem. The last one. Yes, I am. I'd like to have a quick take on. Do you have a quick take on pip8, flick8, and black, the two formatting books? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so pip8 is uh, the, one of the first uh, style guides for Python. It was designed to help us create code that looks similar to everyone else's code. Right? Some of the Python language itself was already created to make sure that everyone's code looked similar. Like that's why we have. Um, so we have meaningful white space. Um, uh, there have been a few other style guide selections and eventually some tools called linters that help you create code that looks similar to each other. The problem comes when you're working in a team. There's always one person on the team that cares more about the style guide than, about, than everyone else. And they're always the person that has to say like, oh, you know, you should put a space here. Oh, you shouldn't put a comment here because that gets annoying. Black is a tool that does exactly that. It fixes the code and it conforms to a smart style guide, but it has no options, which means that if the team chooses black, basically black becomes the bad guy. And if you don't like the style that comes up, everyone can just say, well, you know, it's the style person. And the team can feel, feel close together. Using tools like black does help you um, internalize um, the, the style guide, but there, there are also ways of quickly refactoring your code and getting to the, the kinds of work that you want to do. Thank you once again, Nick. Please, please thank Nick. Um,